Good morning and welcome to Let's Talk Autism. I'm Nancy Allspaugh Jackson. And I'm Shannon Penrod and so thrilled Hello. to be here, to with, be here my with you. Good friends. Yes. Uh, lots of things to cover today and two amazing guests. We've got Jill Stacy who's going to be with us uh, and she's the author editor of Autism Mothers Speak Out, mm -hmm. a bunch of autism moms uh, writing and right. about it's their like experience. Right, it's an anthology of different moms. A really fun idea. So she's going to be with us and then we have Katherine Robertson. Uh, a mom who has started a, a social group for her son, inspired uh -huh. by her son. I always love our stories that when we cover the power of one, one right. mom who sees right. a need and says, you know, there's this, which is okay, and exactly. there's this, which is okay, but I don't quite have what I need for my son. So, so I'll so start it. I'll create it. Um, and, and her is as a social peers group. So and and utilizing other things. She's not reinventing a wheel. She's taking pieces of things that already work and uh -huh. putting them together, synthesizing right. them. Love it. Right, it's great. So we'll talk about that. But we've got a little bit of news for you. We pared down a little bit because some of right. the things we had hurt our heads. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were too too, too scientific. We weren't um, ready for that this but, morning. I mean, here's something they, to talk about. There's been an ongoing issue with Disneyland. Yes, and ever since they did away with uh, the guest assistance, guest pass. assistance pass, which everybody loved so much, and then it was suddenly awesome. it was gone. It used to be that Disneyland was at the forefront of how to treat individuals who were on the autism spectrum. Right. You would go to one of the parks, you would go to one of the first buildings, and different, and depending on which land, but you would go in and you would say, "My my." child has autism, they would give you this thing that said guest uh, guest assistance pass. Uh -huh. There was no word of disability on it. And that allowed you, depending on, and there were stamps that they could put on it that if you needed help getting out of a wheelchair, it gave right. you a certain pass. Right. If you, you know, didn't have a wheelchair, but you didn't have to, you know, they would say to you, what kinds of things do they have issues with, but you didn't have to have proof. It was just what kind of what what is preventing you from enjoying the happiest place right. on earth? And, it was, and they would stamp it, and, and it make made it, it the happiest place oh, on earth because we were able to take our children. Wyatt can't wait in lines, and there was no way he could have waited in the lines at Disneyland. The first time we went to Disneyland with Jem, I we left after two hours after paying hundreds of dollars, and we left. And I remember going to the parking lot saying, "We'll never ever be able to right, come back. This right. is not open to us," right. because we had waited in line for that storybook ride. We waited over an hour in the sun, and Jem started to lose it, and he started trying to kick the girl in line ahead. Uh -huh. So, the, and we were trying to corral him, but you know, you're in this tight space where there's not a lot right, that right. you really can do. And right as this was happening, and they forced us to get out of the line, they were like, "He can't be in a line if he's gonna if you can't control him." I understand that, but right as they were doing that, they shut down the ride right, too. Right. Right. Oh, and he had the mother of all meltdowns, uh -huh. and we had to leave. And I thought, well, if he, if I can't control him in the line, the truth of the matter was that he stood there peaceably for 40 minutes, which right. is amazing. And absolutely But he couldn't amazing. do an hour in the right. sun. So he could have ridden it. But the guest assistance so, pass made it so that he could get right on the ride. Yeah, they could get right on the ride, which and was then, great. There was controversy. Then they did away with that. And they did away with it for a very good reason, because enterprising people were saying they were actually hiring people with disabilities so they could get skip line, and which I, is just shameful. I can't believe people would actually do that. I was like, it's a job. I know that you and everybody else disagreed with me. I was like, that's an employment opportunity. I get it that it's that it's horrible and it's wrong. I do, but I was seeing that, well, that person got paid. <laughs> I understand they're cheating the system, but there was that part of it. I get it. Everybody disagrees with me on that. But in any case, it, they made it public. NBC News you know, did this whole expose on it, and Disneyland, I think, was like mortified. Right, right. And they said, we're changing it all to this other thing, which... It's similar to the Fast Pass program system but they still have to wait up to 15 minutes it's called oh, up the to DAS minutes. card or disability access service card listen I love Disneyland okay I absolutely and we still go to Disneyland but I have been now with multiple children who are on the spectrum or have other disabilities and I have worked this system extensively now and the thing about it is is that I understand that why they've done it but it does make it so that there are some people who just can't be there. So you've this. actually been this, since they've had the DAS Oh, yes. System. I've been multiple times. Okay. And the thing about it is, is that 
you have to go and stand in line first at these little huts that they have right. to be able to get a time and then, you know, and they scan your passes and then you can go to that ride okay. uh, at that time. But you still have to stand in line. Right. And it's still, there are all these things and you have to understand the ins and outs of it. And that's assuming that a child, because, you know, you're walking through the park and the child sees the ride and they go, oh, 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 I want to go on that ride. Every other child, you can go and you can get in line and you can go on that ride. Well, for our kids, it's, okay, now if you want to go on that ride, we have to walk significantly across the park we have to somebody has to go stand in line they have to have all the passes you have to have the person nearby so that you can say no that's him so that you prove that you're not trying to cheat the system right At, which means a whole lot of waiting for our kids yes. a whole lot of waiting. well there are a lot of people that aren't happy with this exactly and they <laughs> and have that's filed. the point of the story um, yes. The uh, 30 lawsuits filed by Disney visitors with autism who allegedly unfairly waited for attractions should go to trial and appeals yes. court rules on Friday. So it will be going to trial. So this whole, but I, I will, and as I said, I love Disney and I still have been with this, but my child is so significantly better. Right. That for me, it, but I, you know, and I, but I've been with smaller children that have other issues. Right. It's tough, you children guys. Children that have meltdowns. This is tough. And this whole idea of, well, you might have to wait 15 minutes in line. I I really disagree with that. Yeah. We've had to wait much longer okay. than 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes to get the time. Then you go and you have to stand in line sometimes for a half an hour. And that's uh, just not going to cut it for a child that's a lot of kids, to It's discriminatory. And can't wait. And, and, and I don't think that's what Disney means for it to be. Um, so I'm glad, and the court has said that it can move forward. forward. There so we'll is what merit. It can move forward. There are merits we will, in those cases. We will definitely see. We have some okay. really sad news. Yes, uh, we do. That a, a friend of the show, somebody that I think we think of as family. Right. Uh, Dominic, Dominic Brown. He, Dominique. He has been on the show several times in several different ways. He's, he's a performed. young performer. He's, he's with the Miracle Project he's and does so a lot brilliant. with them. He's so brilliant. Right. Uh, He's he, performed at Denim and Diamonds numerous times. Yes, and, and really talented singer and songwriter, and we've known the family. Um, this this is uh, Dominique. I'm sure you guys and remember him. There. there he is with his mother and father. Mo Monique and Norman. And uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, Dominique on his Facebook said, this is a really bad day. My grandmother just passed away. And we all, and he said, I feel so bad. Right. And, and we all were sort of gathering around him on Facebook to say, you know, we're so sorry. And his grandmother had been sick and this mm -hmm. was sort of not out of the blue, uh, but, you know, devastating. Right. First hard. big loss for him. And then within hours on the same day, he posted again and said, oh, no, this is a terrible day. My father has died. So, and Norman did pass away. Right. And just a devastating loss for a this family. A double loss for his father dying is just and, horribly tragic. Oh, so tragic. And so we had wanted to say that our hearts go out to Monique and Dominique and... Um, we're, we're so, Norman was such a good guy. Such a good guy and such an amazing father to Dominique. Yes, and so and unexpected. So supportive of his career and, and we're just really sad about and this. And way too young. Um, really uh, want to send our heart and love uh, to this family. To the whole family. And remember Norman as the amazing autism dad right. that he was. Right. Just devastating. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and then yes. we're going to come back with Jill Stacy, who's the author-editor of Autism Mothers Speak Out, a wonderful anthology of stories from mothers really around the world talking about their experiences and amazing things they've done to help our community. And she's going to be coming to us from South Africa, right. which Don't is a very Right, what time cool it thing. is there, I, who knows? I, it could be the middle of the night, it could be... I'm going to guess it's 10 hours difference. Okay. I had to do a South African conference, and, it, and that was 10, and I think it was, uh, I, I think it was close. Okay. So we'll see. Let's, okay, let's we'll see. We'll be we'll back see. soon. Stick with us. For the month of August, I figured we'd do some fun in the sun activity. We're going to make our very own frozen bowling game. It's super fast and super easy. I was inspired by some lessons I saw in skills. All right, so let's get to it. The materials you'll be needing are water, water bottles, balloon, and food coloring, which is always optional. First step you're going to do is make your bowling ball, since it'll have to freeze overnight. 
the first thing I'm going to do is take my balloon and put a few drops of food coloring in it. This is optional. Um, if you don't have food coloring or your child has an allergy to it, don't use it, but I thought it'd be fun to make everything super colorful. So, I have my food coloring. I'm going to put a few drops in here. And then, you know, take it to the sink and fill it up with water and tie it a knot. Here's my balloon filled with water and the food coloring. I'm going to take this and place it in the freezer with some towels just so it holds its shape better. Our next step is to make the bowling pins. I have 10 recycled water bottles that I've refilled with water. Now I'm going to put some food coloring in them. Straight to the center at full speed. Light will surround you in a blink of an eye. Now that my bowling ball is frozen and my pins have been filled with water, let's go outside and play with these. See all the colors in the sky tonight. Time to let the sunshine hide. I hope you and your family have fun with the frozen bowling game like I did with my friend Emily. Well, until next time, craft on, guys. Bye. Can you Whee! see me flying by your side? Hello, fellow activists. Last segment, we talked about step three, get support. Step number four is don't compare, run your own race. Now, it's one thing to aspire to be like someone that's really helped their child. We all wanna do that. That's really different than keeping up with the Joneses. That only serves to make you envious and full of regret. There will always be someone who has a child with autism who is doing better than yours, and there will always be someone who has a child with autism who's doing worse than yours. One morning I was talking to the mom of a recovered child who told me he had been moved into the gifted class. Well, I had heard that week that my own son, who was in fifth grade, was reading at first grade level. Now, I have to admit, I was kind of proud of him until that phone call, which put me over the edge. The green-eyed monster of jealousy. Well, later that same day, I got into the elevator as I was taking my son to clinic. There was a father with his two sons, one typical and one with severe autism. He was pretty much nonverbal, but he did make some very strange sounds over and over again. He had bite marks, scratches all over his arms. He wore mittens to protect him from himself. The father, however, had a big smile on his face. Needless to say, the universe was sending me a message that day. Don't compare. Be grateful for the progress your child has made and will continue to make. So until next time, keep running your own race at your own pace. Don't forget to stop for water and keep the faith. Is that your smile? I've been looking at you forever, yet I never saw you before. I beat your head. As a celebrity, whatever that means, you want to do what you can to get back. The way I've always looked at it, I'm available, I'm going to be there. And when you get there and you see what folks are doing and the lives that they're touching, how can you not want to continue to be a part of it? And for the first time, I am looking in your eyes. What can we all do to make a difference? Not only with trying to find the cure, but to help the children and the families that may not have the resources for these kids. When you're looking back at me, now I understand. None of us are doing enough, but I think that we're doing as much as we possibly can. Because we all live in society, and the more we can all do to help society, the more it helps all of us. Yeah. And for the first time, I am looking in your eyes. And for the first time, I'm seeing who you are. I can't believe how much I see. Now I understand what love is, love is, for the first time. 
And we're back with Let's Talk Autism from that break with wonderful Brian McKnight. Um, Lovely pictures with your child. Uh, yeah, Wyatt was and in that. And Carter Thiero, who is Fanny Thiero's handsome, son. Handsome, handsome young, handsome young man. man. Um, and now we are joined by our guest all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa, Jill Stacy. Welcome to the show, Jill. Good day. Thank you. Good day. Thanks We're for to have you here. being here all the way from South Africa. And uh, we're here to talk about your wonderful book, Autism Mothers Speak Out. Um, and tell us, Jill, this is an anthology of stories from different autism moms from around the world. Tell us why you put this book together. Uh, it was actually Maggie Golding's idea, my co-editor. Um, she's been in the field of autism for about 60 years, so she has spent a lot of time with mothers who, when their child was diagnosed years ago, um, there was that refrigerator mother uh, ghastly label that the mother was um, distant from their child and hence the manifestations which at that point they didn't really know was autism. Um, and Maggie, knowing what these mums went through and the rest of us over the last sort of 30, 40 years, she wanted their voice to be heard and also the achievements they, they have made over the years personally and in local service and national service provision. And she just want, she felt it was very important that their short story was shared. So Tom, some, sorry, Shannon. Some of these moms actually believed they were at the time that refrigerator mother syndrome was actually a believable was being bought by the mainstream of, of the public. There was a there was a terrible time um, in your in the book. You'll see there's some quite older children, um, and the pair the mothers were blamed for the child. It wasn't really accepted as being a physiological condition, but a psychological condition. Um, so the original title Maggie wanted was not Refrigerator Mothers. Uh, myself and Jessica Kingsley Publishers weren't too keen on that because we don't want that, that wording to come back. But I think Maggie just wanted to show the, the massive changes that have taken place and how some of those mums had to go through that period when yes that's what the public thought that's what the doctors thought well talk to us a little bit jill about the availability of resources in south africa and i know you have some thoughts and feelings about that that even the availability of resources isn't always to the benefit of the child explain what you mean by that well um i have a 33 year old son with autism and on my path when he was young, there was a national body in this country, but there were no full-time offices. So there were five schools in the country at that time that were doing a sterling job. They got together once a year, and then they disbanded and carried on working well with their local schools, but there was nothing for the other parents that were, didn't have their children um, in services. So we started the national office um, in South Africa, I'm trying to think, probably 20 odd years ago. Um, and our biggest thrust was always to upskill teachers in the lower resourced areas. Um, it has been a challenge because we haven't had government support. So a lot of children are being taken into schools, but it's still a great mission to ensure that they are receiving um, good services, that they're not just being babysat in a classroom. So it's it's a massive challenge, but the time I've been involved, which is sort of 27 years, I've seen a massive change. But yes, we have a very long way to go. And how does that, how has that, that lack of good resources shaped the mothers in that area? Uh, what I found, I find interesting in, in South Africa and uh, other lower resource countries, the, power, the, the parents empower themselves greatly. They make great pioneers, great um, fighters for the cause. And I think 
if everything is waiting for you, it is more relief for the parents and the parents having to fight for everything or create their own home program. But it's made some incredible pioneers from parents in this country um, and to the benefit of their child and to other children. Wonderful. Can you tell us some of the, maybe tell us a story or two from the book um, that might stand out for you so uh, we can talk about some of the other mom's stories? Well, there's 15 mums who have written chapters from all around the world. Um, we have India versus America. When I say that, I, again, I'm going back to the resources. But the mum who wrote from USA, she and her husband ended up creating um, their own services because even New in New Jersey there weren't services for their child, um, which has had a far-reaching effect on other children in New Jersey. Then you look at um, African parents in South Africa, uh, the same thing. Um, they've come, one has come from a so-called first world country and one's come from a, a third world country, including India, but the difference those mothers have made and therefore the services their child has received regardless of the environment. That I found very interesting to, to witness. It is um, that, That's one of the, we thought we would have a story from America that would be all about everything was there waiting. It wasn't. It really wasn't. Um, so it was, it's been very interesting to watch the parallels of people from India um, and Australia and England and how actually the paths are very, very similar. Lack of applicable resources and parents making what they believe is right for theirs and other children. And you have referenced in your material to us a conference that you're really excited about that's happening in November. Talk to us about that. Um, yeah, the world, so the World Autism Organization, similar to the thread of the book, um, was formed by uh, parents who, exactly the same, have created services within their own country. And it tends to be national services that these, that a group of us um, have created. And we come together as parents to create the World Autism Organization with the main thrust of trying to encourage those that have to reach out to those who don't have. Um, and and we, it's our fifth Congress. It will be taking place in Houston, 12th to 15th of November this year. Uh, we had a very successful one in Monterey. And we thought, therefore, let's build on Monterey, Mexico, and work in Houston, where, again, there are very, very limited resources. So we do try to aim to have congresses to bring good speakers to the local area, introduce them to the local parents, and as happened with us in Cape Town in South Africa, those speakers then carried on reaching out to the local people after the congress. And that's what we are anticipating, hoping to ha you know, that would happen in Houston. Very exciting. What are the dates for that? I see that it's in November. 12th to the 15th of November. Okay, amazing. In Houston, Sounds like Texas. an amazing conference. Tell us about your son now, uh, today. He's 33 years old. Yeah, Michael, my little boy. Uh -huh. <laughs> 33-year-old young man. Um, he is what the sort of medical profession classify as classic autism. Um, he has autism and he has intellectual impairment. He has, he's never spoken and he, he doesn't understand the verbal word, um, but he's gorgeous. <laughs> he's uh -huh. a challenge, but uh, he's uh, a big, red-headed, beautiful boy. Good and do you have him in a program? Are there programs in South Africa for older uh, young adults with autism and adults with autism? There are a couple of... And that that is one of the big deficits in this country is everyone is focusing on early intervention, which is 100% right. But yes, adult services are not that good. Um, he is in a non-autism specific centre. 
Um, the main reason that I chose that centre is it's on a large, well not large, but it's a five acre farm and he loves to be outside and he loves freedom and he loves to run. Um, and he, so he's not in one of the community based uh, centres that I could have sent him to. He loves his space. Um, they've been very good. They've taken on autism specific training. They've adapted to his needs. He's adapted to being in a non-autism uh, environment, which is also good. And thanks, Michael, they have also taken in other uh, young adults with autism. That's wonderful. Um, that's amazing. Good. What an amazing thing. So the book, Autism Mothers Speaks Out, is available now. How can people get it, Jill? Um, it is available through our publishers, Jessica Kingsley uh, Publishers, um, and it's also um, available through Amazon. It is available on Kindle, um, so it, it it's it's out there. It's very much out there, and now we've been asked to look at creating Dad Speak Out, oh, love which it. I think will be very exciting. That's yeah, amazing. it's very exciting. It's I been... mean, the dads have a face. Go ahead. What were you saying about the dads? I think dads, from my experience, men tend to keep their issues to themselves. Us girls will sit and have a good chat and a laugh and a cry. And I think men don't have the same support that women do through the way they live and don't talk enough. So we're hoping that this... this this uh, dad's book, which we're going to start working on, will give dad support if they Wonderful. feel uncertain about sitting and chatting to other dads. I love Sounds it. Sounds great. Absolutely love it. Jill, thank you so much for this wonderful project and for being with us. I'm going to ask you to stay on the line with us as we go to break. We're going to go to break, and then in just a few minutes, we're going to be back with Catherine Robertson talking about DC Peers. So stick with us. Nobody ever asks a kid with autism, what is it you'd really like to do? At this school, we ask the kids, what is your goal? What is your dream? Exceptional Minds is a vocational training program for young adults on the autism spectrum who want to have careers in computer animation and visual effects. I think young people with autism are totally underestimated. When you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. They all have different talents, different skills, and what surprised me is that there really are no limits, that if these guys believe that they can do something, they really can. It's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of young adults with autism are unemployed or underemployed. A lot of young adults still live at home, a lot of them suffer from depression and are very isolated from the rest of the world, and the opportunities for them are very limited. We want to develop careers for our young adults. Our full-time program runs three years, at the end of which we have job placement and job coaching. We have a work readiness program. We also have our own in-house studio so that when our students graduate, they can do on-the-job training and work on real projects. We outsourced about 30, 40 shots to the team here. They did fantastic work that we can put into a movie and be proud of it. It's great. I mean, we want to do it again. And the studio is their first step into the professional world, the first step in their new careers as digital artists. The whole purpose is to get the students out into the real world. We all have the same dreams. We want significance, dignity, and purpose with our lives. We have an opportunity to give those three words to every single student at this school who will actually be able to go out and participate in the dream. This is my first full-time, full-paying job. I primarily work in After Effects. I learned After Effects at Exceptional Minds. It seemed like a good place for me to fit in because I was interested in animation. Right from the first day that Nikki set foot in our company, he was producing work for us. 
We saw what level of professionalism is being instilled in them from the very beginning. This was the first opportunity where Nikki could combine something he loved to do with something he was really, really good at that could eventually lead to employment. When we first met Kevin, he was working at a supermarket bagging groceries, and they said he would never amount to anything else. I work at Stargate Studios, and uh, I'm a junior compositor. I mainly do like rotoscoping right now, and I'm still learning. I think that you find great talent in the most amazing places. The students at Exceptional Minds have had a fair amount of training to get them ready for the visual effects environment. If it wasn't for Exceptional Minds, I might still be at the supermarket and I might be living at my parents' house. Everything's changed. Nikki has purpose. It feels like I'm a member of society now. He's capable of making it on his own. Once you get inside and you see what's really happening there, you immediately want to be a part of it. It's the dream factory, you know, the movie business. And, and if you can connect people with their dreams, then the magic happens. At Exceptional Minds, we like to say that we are changing lives one frame at a time. Adults don't really believe kids. They think, ah, oh, kids are kids. What are they talking about? But when a child stands up for what they believe in, it's so strong and powerful. I first got involved with autism advocacy four years ago when my friend was diagnosed. When I found out about my friend's diagnosis, I didn't really understand what it meant. to me or change our friendship. I didn't look at her any differently. We still had so much fun together. Now I know that she experiences life a little differently than me, and that's okay. Knowing what she goes through has helped me to understand and be more caring towards other people in similar situations. I got involved with ACT Today because I wanted to do whatever I could to help. They provide options like behavioral therapy, medical care, social skills programs, assistance to military families, and much more. Being there for my friend was my number one priority. I've been volunteering and spreading the word about the cause via my social media platform because raising awareness is a crucial first step. There needs to be more kids and teens involved to make sure that our voices are heard just as loudly as the adults. You may be small like me, but your acts of kindness are not. Talk to us a little bit about what your degree is in. City planning or urban planning. I got it from Cal State Northridge with a degree in cinema and television arts with an emphasis in screenwriting. And what are you interested in, Eli? Um, a video game internship. Computer programming? I'm hoping to combine entertainment or travel, my two passions. Ooh, what kind of jobs have you worked? Bakery inventory. Okay, inventory. Talk about your volunteer job. I'll push your to to help the soldiers. You volunteered to help the soldiers? Yes. I interned in the National Parks in the Santa Monica Mountains, which is very urban mm -hmm. area. So I worked with the uh, situ problems of how it's impacting the surrounding community, like the, uh, the flow of traffic and the flow of people and what they could do to plan and the parking. I've been to China. I've been all around Europe. I've been to Thailand, Japan, Australia. You can create an app? That's impressive. Yeah. Really cool thing. Can you teach other people how to make yeah. an app? If you have a choice between uh, working or not working, working, you like working. Yes. Why? What do you like about working? It is fun. I would work. Yeah, you would choose work. Why? Cause I have people more that um, get um, get paid and enjoy, enjoy it and. I want to make sure I have enough money so I can save it. Why do you need to have a full-time job? I mean, it's kind of like a duh thing, right? No, obviously, so <laughs> yeah. I can support myself. Right. And hopefully a family down the line, but at least at first, I, myself. I'm very dependable, and uh, 
always reliable and get to my job on time. What excites you about working a job or being an intern? Learning new skills. Yeah. What has it meant to you having this job and having the stability of a job that you've had for multiple years? It's meant the world because I'm able to do everything, that, almost everything I wanted to do because of that job. Welcome back. We're working on an issue with Skype. Um, get, on try, our guests try and get then. Catherine Robertson on with us from DC Peers, but right. until we get that technical But we have a uh, bunch glitch, of questions There's from some people. questions that came yeah. in while you were now, doing Dr. Uh, Dr. Doreen. Over the last week, we've had several people write into the show and say, what happened? You know, did YouTube take down all the videos that were the A word? Why are they not available on YouTube anymore? People expressing concern about the family and is everything okay? So I wanted to give everybody a little bit of information about that. We ourselves have taken the videos down of uh, the A word for the time being. This was a request um, from the family because he is at an age uh -huh. where it's important for him to take this next little bit of time mm -hmm. and then for him to make a determination later on how he feels about this. Okay. So, but he is well and thriving and the family wants you all to know that they're all well and thriving. That's great. And we supported them in this decision and, and happily, you know, took the, the videos down ourselves. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, have that disclosure. Yeah, great. Right. Um, and, you know, because it is important and kids get to be at a certain age with their friends. And, and I think it's a great thing that the family is saying, you know, we want to. And, and sometime later on, um, you know, who knows uh, what, what will happen. Right. But uh, we, we totally in support of that. Okay. And of that family and deeply appreciative for everything that they have done. Yeah, let us document and, and, his life. And for, for years have that available for right. people. And now, you know, it's so important to always, don't you find this, Nancy? I find that sometimes I'm doing something and then my son now has the capability to say to me, I want you to think about whether that's good for me or uh -huh. not. And I and I'm you know that's stunning and fabulous. But we all have to think about that always. Right. What's best for for the child? Right. What's best for right. the individual? And right now, this is what's best for him. Okay. And so that's what's happening with that. Um, but thank you for your concern and for writing in about that. Now, uh, Lisa wrote in uh, at the end of the Ask Dr. Doreen and said, how do you help some kids who are very picky eaters? He's a very big boy for his age, 99th percentile in all levels of his age. Mm -hmm. And don't you find that the pickier the eater, uh, the child, the, the more, they so they'll only eat three things, yes. but they will eat those three things in larger amounts right that's true and then have issues sometimes with you know sometimes it can be that their sodium intake is too high right. or their carbohydrate or, or their carbohydrate is too high or their weight gets too mm -hmm. high or their blood pressure or cholesterol or if you're only eating limited things right. it tends to lead to uh, an increase of something. So we've we've done many shows with many experts talking about food Eating. selectivity. And there are many papers about this, but the one thing that, that across the board that everybody agrees with is that you go slow and that you pair the preferred food with the food that you want them to do. So if, let's say that what he eats are chicken nuggets, mm -hmm. right? That that's, he eats chicken nuggets and mashed potatoes, great. So what do you want him to be able to eat? I think that broccoli, broccoli mm -hmm. and carrots are two of the green easiest beans. things. Green beans are easy. Gr green beans are, are relatively easy, but the, what, for what I'm talking about doing, some it depends on which kind of green beans, mm -hmm. because you, what you want to be able to do is mush it and oh, you're going right. to you're going to grind it up and then you're going to take the very small and I'm talking like so small that only your naked eye can see the amount of carrots that you are going to stick into that mashed potato. Right. You're just going to tuck it in there, stir it around and you should stick in such a small amount that he doesn't notice it. And he eats the mashed potatoes anyway and you go, "I got away with right, it," right? right? Then you then you just increase it ever so slightly. You'll get to a point where he'll go, "Ah, Right? And then you go back to the last amount that worked. And you keep, you know, sneaking it in, sneaking it in, sneaking it in until eventually, I mean, they've done so many studies on this, you guys, where eventually they're eating the carrots and not the mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so and you think to yourself okay this maybe carrots is going to take two months uh -huh. and you think well i don't have two months my child needs vegetables now right but this is what works right and at the end of two months your child will be eating carrots and then and you can be sneaking broccoli into mm -hmm. something else there are Jessica Seinfeld. Is it Jessica Seinfeld? The yes. Seinfeld. She had a cold. She wrote book a book, book about that. About right. sneaking How to, vegetables yeah. in into Guess brownies what and various but other don't things. Don't necessarily follow her recipe completely. Put a small amount. Right. You want I, them to eventually know what the food is and like yes. the food. Yes. But yeah. but start slow. Right. Work up to the recipe. Then exceed the recipe. I do this with my husband, and can I tell you, it works. <laughs> um, I, I, I okay, did meatloaf we, I with carrots and broccoli. We've got our we have our guest now. We have Catherine Roberts for joining us. Well, we're going to take a we're break. We're going to take a break, then come back. Great. Okay. This is Logan Shepard. At first glance, he looks like a typical American teenager. He plays in a band, loves hanging out with his friends, he doesn't like doing homework, and he's not really fond of broccoli. But Logan Shepard is not your typical 14-year-old. Logan was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He was nonverbal, made no eye contact, and his parents were told to abandon all hope. Instead, his parents began an intensive intervention treatment at its center was a quality ABA program known as the CARD method. This is Logan Shepard now. All I really want to say is like, I'm kind of copying Martin Luther King. I kind of have a dream like that one day, like I can just like inspire people and never give up. Cause like, that's what I want to do in life. Cause if I can succeed, they can succeed and I will succeed. To follow Logan's musical journey, visit www.facebook.com slash official drummer rock or at drummer rock on Instagram. For more information on the card method, visit www.centerforautism.com or call 800-345-CARD. Rock on, Logan. And we are back, and as promised, we have Katherine Robertson with us, now coming to us from Washington, D.C. She is the founder of D.C. Peers, which is a new nonprofit in Washington, D.C. that is working to raise awareness of autism and neurodiversity and to create social opportunities for young people on the spectrum combined with neurotypical young people. Welcome to the show, Katherine. Thank you so much for having me. And we understand that you've got your, your some almost all of your family with you. That they were going to come in and, and be in the shot. We, we want to meet your husband and your son. Okay, great. Um, I'll start with my daughter because she's right here being my studio assistant. Oh, okay. oh good. Your daughter um, is there. Okay. Buffy helped me recruit um, all um, the neurotypical peers at the beginning, um, and I'm going to miss her a lot because she's going to college in two days. Ah. Oh. Walter and this is Walter. Walter helped make sure the lessons made sense. Hi, Hi Walter. Hi, Walter. <laughs> and, and your okay, husband. Now, okay, then. Uh, Bye. Um, my husband here um, has been helping me with the board and with um, all kinds of things. He's also our trivia master when we do our trivia nights. And um, he's helped me also present a lesson on dating. <laughs> okay, so this is really yeah. a family affair. Yeah. Yes, it really is. Okay, okay that's thanks, great. Guys. <laughs> and what a good-looking family, too. Oh, uh, thank you. Very well, charming. Talk oh, to us about those doors. Talk to us about the mission of DC Peers and what you're trying to do with it. Um, I, without stating the mission, you know, in its um, uh, professional language, the mission is is to do new things with social skills, to do something that. Uh, kids on the autism spectrum want to do and to um, help them connect with typical peers um, and to raise awareness of neurodiversity and autism so that everybody realizes what a benefit is it is if if um, if we can connect each other better 
Now, Catherine, you are a, a big fan of social skills. We've all heard their social skills classes have, have popped up all over the country. Um, insurance is funding them now. They've been all over the place. You participated in some of those groups. But you, correct me if I'm wrong, you saw that there was the, this piece that was missing. What exactly happened that made you go, I'm going to have to create something new? Well, a lot of the social skills classes that I have, that I know of and have experienced or experienced through my son are kind of for younger kids. There aren't that many um, programs specifically for high school students because high school students stop really wanting to listen to adults and parents um, and they want to listen to each other. They want kind of want a peer input um, or at least they, they should get some. Um, um, and also because I don't think adults know everything there is to know about high school social life. And I really wanted to bring high school kids into the mix and help them help, help me figure out um, what we needed to put on the table. What are the social dilemmas for all high school students? And also, um, correct me if I'm wrong, because this has always been something that's bothered me and, and I've, that I've looked at and gone, and this doesn't make total sense to me, is that most of the social skills classes have uh, only individuals who are on the autism spectrum, so they're practicing social skills with other people who are needing to practice social skills, so you, they don't really ever get to practice with somebody who's really adept at it which does not seem like a good teaching model to me. Did it make sense to you? Yes, and, and it also, it, the, the underlying message there is that there's something wrong with our kids. And, you know, obviously that's a big uh, topic, the topic of neurodiversity and that paradigm. But the idea that our kids need to go to clinics and special classes and learn how to socialize properly and then be sent w without any practice with the typical um, population and then be sent out to try to do that successfully without really any um, uh, uh, practice with typical peers is it's almost impossible I, I don't think that those that that model works so tell us about your model well at first I want to uh, make a caveat and say I'm not trying I told the parents when I first um, had a meeting about my group that this was an experiment. And I haven't done any outcome studies or anything. Um, but what my model is to put typical and autistic teenagers in the room together and teach them all the same things with some context, um, saying that some of these things are more difficult for others. Um, we do a training at the beginning explaining that, explaining the neurology of social interaction and why it's difficult um, for some of us to make eye contact or to read expressions. Um, but after ex having explained all that, we go through each of these skills um, and have all the kids practice them and work on them together. And there's, um, it's eye-opening for the typical kids. And it's exciting for the, the Spectrum kids because they're also being given credit as teachers and coaches. Yeah. Um, if they don't understand an interaction, um, I encourage them to, you know, advocate for themselves and say, I don't know if you're joking or not, or can you slow down? I need a little context, that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's not that different from the UCLA peers model that I um, really admire and used to get going. Um, the difference is having the typical peers there and having this slightly different perspective um, that for, it's a two-way learning process. And we understand that your daughter, who we just met a little bit ago, um, helped you put the, the typical kids together and their background is what, theater? Can you tell us about that? Yes. Uh, her high school, it's a big public high school here in D.C. and it's got a wonderful theater program and she is a theater kid. And she drafted a bunch of her friends who she knew were interested, who knew Walter. And it was a wonderful group to begin with because they came in open-minded and willing to role play and willing to, to try things out. 
Um, you know, a lot of teenagers can get very shy and nervous about getting up and trying something, trying a greeting or an introduction, and um, they were willing to do it. And um, uh, what I was amazed at is how excited they were about it and how all those who weren't graduating came back the second year. And um, when I was recruiting a new round, um, I asked them, one of the a group during the first training, why are you interested in doing this? And they said, I'm really curious about autism. They don't teach us anything about it. And we know that we have autistic peers. Um, so I've learned a lot from them about how willing and interested and sympathetic high school kids are if you give them a chance. You're creating something that's amazing. So we're almost out of time. Tell us how can people who are in the DC area find out more information? And if there's a way for people who are all over the world and watching this, and if they want to create a, you know, a mirror to DC peers in their part of the world, is there a way that they can do it? I, that's my goal is to be able to package something to, to give away. Um, the best thing is to write me. Um, and maybe the easiest way to give you that information is just to give the website. Although it's not quite up and running, there's a placeholder there where you can get my email address. It's www.dcpeers.com. Okay. okay. And it should be .org, but it's .com for now. <laughs> okay. And um, so do you start, do you follow the school year or does it go all year long? We basically started follow the school year. We tried to run some clubs this summer, but there were a lot of kids in and out. They weren't in control of their schedules and their vacations and stuff. Okay, so if people um, so have, have teenagers who would like to participate in the D.C. area, you're getting ready to start a new uh, mm -hmm. season, correct? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful. So I okay. want to encourage people to go and check that out. Really want to applaud you. I, I, I always talk here on the show about the power of one. Right. One mom who sees, one a, mom need who sees says, a need and yeah. says there's a better way to do this. Uh, we really appreciate that you've taken this on and, and created a great model. Thank you so much. I appreciate your show. It's fantastic. Well, thank, thank you, you, Catherine. We appreciate you, too.